Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's a great pleasure to introduce Todd Austin. Um, Todd got his PhD at the uh, University, University of Wisconsin in 1996. Uh, he's currently a professor at the University of Michigan in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. Um, Todd's been doing lots of really interesting work in uh, architecture for many years. Um, one of his great contributions is, is the Simple Scalar Toolset, which is widely used by the entire architecture community. Todd also got a Maurice Wilkes Award uh, for Innovative Contributions to Computer Architecture in 2007, I think. And uh, today he's going to be talking about uh, using hardware to find security bugs. So uh, that's something of interest to many of us here. And uh, please welcome Todd. Thank you. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think it's been four years since I last visited. Um, yeah, so my background is in computer architecture. Most people think my background is in computer architecture, but really my research is all about finding and fixing bugs and faults. So I work a lot in fault tolerant systems. I work in finding software bugs. And when you work in software verification, you can't help but overlap heavily with security because a lot of security bugs, are the, a lot of security vulnerabilities are the result of software bugs. So today I want to talk about uh, some work that my, two of my PhD students have been working on. A few years ago, Eric Larson, who's now at Seattle University, uh, worked on some work on security vulnerability analysis of programs. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then my current graduate student, Joe Greyhouse, has been working on developing techniques to scale the performance of super heavyweight but super powerful security vulnerability analyses. And I'll talk about that work. That's called Testudo. And this is also joint with other students and faculty as well. All right, so I'm sure I don't have to spend much time on this slide, but you know, security vulnerabilities are uh, a big problem. And I'm sure at Microsoft everybody knows this. But I will show you one thing. Um, Yes, I picked on Microsoft Windows, but that's not the only system that has bugs in it, too, that people can exploit. Linux is more and more being found to have lots of uh, security bugs. And even simple devices, you don't even need an operating system. Simple devices like RFIDs can be attacked as well. Um, so many security vulnerabilities are the result of bugs in software. So if you can fix these bugs, you can eliminate the vulnerability as opposed to trying to detect the vulnerability and stop it when it occurs. If you fix the bug, you don't carry the payload of trying to find that vulnerability and fix it at runtime. Let's take a look at an example of one security vulnerability bug. And a classic one is the buffer overflow attack. So I've got this piece of code here, which uh, it's a function that's got some variable on the stack, some local variables as well. And it reads some input from an external source. And the reason why this is a bug is because it, this particular function here doesn't limit the amount it reads to 256. Now, if somebody comes and injects data into this read input call here, and it's less than 200 integers, it only partially fills this buffer and everything's fine. The program intended as it runs as it was intended. But if somebody reconstructs the protocol, for example, and just injects more data into it, and even violates the, the purpose of the protocol, say it injects more than 256 integers in here, what happens in this particular attack is it overwrites the buffer, then the local variables above it, and eventually gets to the return address. The nature of this particular attack is make this data that you injected into the program code, and then try to figure out the address to jump back into your own injected data. Once you've done that, you've done what you fundamentally need to do to implement this attack, which is redirect control from external data. And then when that's done, you could take over the machine. There's a variety of things you could do in this buffer to take over the machine. So how do you fix these vulnerabilities? What's the classic approach that's used most widely today to fix these bugs that become security vulnerabilities? And it's as follows. Write your application. Deploy your application to your customers. Let people attack your customers. Customers get upset, complain to you, debug the attacks. 
then fix the software and repeat. Now, this is effective, but it has some downsides. One, you get upset customers when they get attacked. And two, you get embarrassed software vendors because some of these bugs can be, you know, frankly, can cause a lot of exposure. So what I want to talk about today is a better way to attack these bugs, and that's through security vulnerability analysis. Let's try and find the bugs that hackers love before we release the software. But there's some challenges to this. But here's the basic approach. Develop your program. Employ security vulnerability analyses. So there's a variety of these. There's many different techniques. I'm going to talk about one today that I helped develop. Variety of techniques. Employ this in the lab. And then debug whatever exposed vulnerabilities you find. Continue to develop your program and then iterate around this cycle until you decide to deploy. The advantage of this approach is that you'll find those bugs before you put them out in the field. But there's, as we're going to see, there's, there's a couple problems with this approach. Well, so it's, it's good for your customers because you get more of those bugs out. But the downside is security vulnerability analysis tends to be extremely heavyweight analyses. And when you're running very heavyweight analyses that slow down programs by hundreds of times, you tend to be myopic in what you can test because you simply don't have the resources to fully test the program. What does it mean to fully test a program? It means to cover all of the feasible paths that the program can possibly execute. And there are billions of paths in non-trivial programs. So if this is slowing down your program hundreds of times, you probably won't even be able to get through your own test suites, let alone a test suite that, or, you know, so for example, a fuzz testing suite thinking you good coverage on paths in your program. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about a technology called Testudo, which pushes those analyses out into the customer base and runs them on every machine every time the program is run using a data flow sampling technique that can limit the amount of CPU and memory resources it takes to do these tests. So the forward progress is made, but it's distributed across a large customer base. The great thing about this approach is it works well with the hacker bug economy which is as follows. Hackers want bugs that occur on many, many machines so that when they devise an attack, they can grab as many machines as possible. In the same scenario, our analyses will run on many, many, many machines. So popular programs will get the most amount of coverage with the security vulnerability analyses. And my conjecture is that we, using this technology, we can get ahead of the attackers and find bugs before they do. Yes? What if you're behind? What if you're running these analysis on machines that have already been owned and part of what that's okay? Yeah. Well, so like all technologies for finding bugs, you can use them both for good and bad, right? So attackers could use these technologies as well. One advantage that I have over the attackers is that I have the advantage of my entire customer base. But an attacker could definitely use this technology also, say, to run these analyses on a botnet, for example. Good point. And the key point here is take the criminal out of your design cycle. I think this is a really good approach to developing software and one that we should all strive for. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about three technologies that, that I've uh, worked on in, in my career. First, I'm going to talk about metadata. Metadata is an important aspect of security vulnerability analysis. It is information that is attached to program data that helps restore programmer intent in the program. As we run programmers, we throw away a lot of information. We need to rematerialize that, that information. And metadata storage locations are where we're going to store that. Then I'm going to talk about one security vulnerability analysis that I helped to develop a few years ago called input bounds checking, which is going to try to determine if the checks on data coming from external sources are sufficient that you, you're, you're eliminating the possibility of, of dangerous memory accesses or changing the control of your program without your knowledge. And then finally, I'm going to talk about my most recent work, which is the Testudo project, which is just dynamic distributed debug. How do we take these super heavyweight analyses and push them out into the field to try and scale the performance and see more of those feasible paths that our, that our, our, our customers are going to execute to try and find more bugs? All right, so let's take a look at metadata. When you run a program, 
Unfortunately, the programmer puts a lot of information at the source level about what it is that he or she wants to do, but it really gets unceremoniously discarded by the compiler and the runtime system. To give you an example, here's a, a metadata strategy that I, I, I published many, many years ago called Fat Pointers, which just tries to rematerialize intent behind how programmers use pointers. In a language like C, for example, a pointer just contains an address to a piece of storage. But it really there's a lot more information there that would be useful to store if we could. For example, what is the variable that was intended to be pointed to? Whether or not the variable is live, whether or not the variable has some externally derived information in it, and whether or not that externally derived information has been checked. All these kind of properties, it's nice that we have a place to store them. So what you'll see is in security vulnerability analyses, you'll see a need to declare, store, and efficiently manage metadata. And so we'll see some of that later in the talk when we look at uh, the Testudo hardware implementation. All right, so with the metadata, we can start to do a security vulnerability analysis. And there's many of these that are available. Let me show you one that I worked on called input bounds checking. All right, so how do attackers look at programs? They basically look at them as big black boxes with a bunch of knobs on them. What are the knobs? The knobs are the inputs that I can put into the program. And for the vast majority of attacks, it is simply finding the correct sequence of turns of these knobs to cause the program to access memory it didn't intend or change control in a way that it did not originally intend. That's the reason why fuzz testing, for example, works so effectively at attacking programs. Because with fuzz testing, you're just turning knobs randomly and looking if the program crashes. So, so a great source of bugs that we can find that can stop security vulnerabilities is just find stuff that comes in from the outside world, these knobs, that go to potentially dangerous operations like memory, indirect pointer accesses, or changes of control in your program, and finding out if they haven't been properly bounded. If we can find those bugs, we found a significant number of bugs in, in that uh, hackers can exploit. So the approach we use with this input bounds uh, vulnerability analysis technique is we take a program and at the low level it operates on you know, integer data and we combine it with a symbolic copy of the same program that does the same exact operations, the adds, the subtracts, the loads, and the stores, but instead of operating on concrete data, operates on symbolic data. So we take every variable, say some variable x has the value of 2, a concrete value, and we clone it, we, we include metadata with x, which captures the range of x, a symbolic value of x. This doesn't declare any particular value of x, but instead declares a predicate which describes the possible values of x. Okay, so x can be this value in the program, and through the metadata, we know what possible values it can be. And we'll see by propagating these symbolic values around and pushing them through computation in a symbolic fashion, we can determine the exact ranges and values of x whenever we do a potentially dangerous operation. Now, if we also track, oh, I got a little, hello. Yeah, if we also track, the uh, type information as well, which in some languages we may have, we may need to rematerialize this inside of our metadata. We can, whenever we have a potentially dangerous operation, we can apply a proof engine at the dereference or the change of control and try to prove, does this predicate violate the constraints of that type of that variable? And you can see if this is a C array, has the value index of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and this x has a range of 1 to 5, we can see that, yeah, there is a possibility that a bug could occur here. Now, what's really powerful with this analysis is there's no attack in this 2. This 2 is perfectly valid. But in the symbolic side of the program, we can see that attack exists. And that's the most powerful aspect of this particular analysis. It finds attacks without an active exploit. It just, because the symbolic side of the computation tracks the range over which the values could exist. 
And if there, doesn't if there does exist a value that could provide an exploit, it'll find it. To find all of the exploits for improperly bounded values, we simply have to have complete control flow coverage of the program. So we simply have to hit all the feasible paths. And we will find all of the, these particular exploits. I'm not, I don't want to go into the details of this analysis, but I want to show you by example how it works. So you can see how symbolic computation in the background is a powerful way to find an exploit. Here's another program which has a bug in it. We've got an array of five elements. We're going to get some input. We're going to check the constraint, uh, the value of the input to see if it's within bounds. Then increment the value. That's where the bug is because it no longer is within the bounds of the array. And then we have a potentially buggy operation. And so we run the program and we get the following values. Two, which is legal, passes our test, increment to three, no bug. But now look at the the symbolic computation which occurs in tandem with the running program. When we get the value of x, we see that the range of x is any legal integer. When we hit the predicate, we know from the direction of the predicate here what the range of x is. x is now greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 4. And we can determine this by telling the direction of the branch understanding the predicate that's associated with the branch, and then using that predicate, intersecting that predicate with this symbolic value to get the range. Then we increment x, and there's a calculus for manipulating all of the symbolic values. So that when I increment x, I simply increment, according to the calculus, the range, the lower and upper bound of x. So now I know x is between 1 and 5. Then I go to this operation, dereference array, then I run my proof engine. I say, can this predicate produce a value which violates the type of that array? And yeah, it can, the value of 5. So no active exploit, I find my bug. That's a very powerful technique. The way we implemented it is we took GCC and we instrumented the code such that as it produced the individual operations, it also coupled them with a symbolic version of the same, of the same uh, low level operation. We then run a test suite, we look at our error reports, and then we go back, fix the code, and iterate around this cycle. So now we're doing that security vulnerability analysis to try and get rid of our bugs. And in the world of security vulnerability analysis, um, when you read papers in that domain, every once in a while you see a paper that actually finds a really good bug. And our paper found what I consider two super high quality bugs. We found two bugs in OpenSSH that were fixed almost immediately. One was a bug, one was a buffer overflow attack, the other was an, an attack that occurred that, uh, where you could uh, use integer overflow to attack the system. But here's the downside of this analysis. Yes? So this technique can find bugs in which you need, if you actually reach the predicate that create the bug, right? If you need yep. another branch to be switched, you know, reach the predicate, then you'll have it. Right? For example, if you have to go to a separate path where the RA check happens, right? First you need an input that mm -hmm. goes to the takes that path. Yes. And then comes to the RA check. Yes. Right. So then this technique might not be able to find it, right? Because you're not generating inputs. You but find bugs on one path. I, I can combine my predicates at the, I mean, when, so I don't quite understand your point. I think he's saying that you only find bugs on branches that were followed during the program execution you analyzed. Yes. And that's driven by the concrete bugs. Correct. Correct. But let's say I cover all of my feasible paths. Will I find all the bugs? So, I, you know, good point. So that's the challenge here is finding all the feasible paths. But there are exponentially many paths. There are many paths. I mean, I don't know how many feasible. Nobody's, nobody can. I mean, we don't know how many feasible paths are in programs. Uh, yeah, they're exponential with the depth of the, of the control graph. There's a lot. So I need a highly scalable technique to implement this analysis. But what, what is your competition practice? Is your path coverage, your branch? I'll, I'll get to some of that. Yes? Are you familiar with type state checking? Type state checking. Yeah, it's from in your meaning 86. It's a static compiler that proves programs correct with respect yep. to this kind of analysis. Yep. Yeah, I'm familiar with that, I've, that work and like the prefix work, a variety of techniques. Right, and those techniques are very similar to this, right? The difference is, is that I'm analyzing 
paths that are run in the program. And those techniques are, are essentially symbolically running the program. Yeah? No, they're static provers. So they can yeah, the program and prove it correct. But they, but they have to do some level of symbolic computation to figure out what paths are possible in the program. No, they're path insensitive. Well, if they're path insensitive, they're going to have tons of positive, uh, yeah. of, of false, positive, false positives. Um, they have false positives in a program that isn't type state safe and they reject it as possibly unsafe. Okay, so we'll, we can talk more about that. But in general, static techniques cannot complete on non trivial programs. Will you give me that one? No. I would give you that one, but dynamic can't either, right? I mean, you, exactly. you don't know you've got Dynamic it. can't either. So what I'm talking about today is a scalable dynamic technique that can go further than any past dynamic technique. And with uh, static techniques, we can do the same thing as well. well. Maybe we can someday meet in the middle and find all of the feasible paths in the program. So good comments. Thank you very much. Yes. So is the only domain you use intervals in your static analysis? Yeah, primarily intervals, although we use a different style of analysis for strings that are more tailored specifically to strings. So the downside of this approach is uh, it's really slow. These are some uh, programs. These are their, uh, the, their original run times, their run times with full instrumentation. And this is how many times slower they run with that instrumentation load on them. And you know, in the best case, about 43% slower. In the worst case, about 200% or 200 times slower. So significant payload in the background there to do that symbolic computation. So it really limits the number of paths that you can, that you can analyze when your program's running hundreds of times slower. So the point of this is this analysis is very effective, but it's extremely expensive. What I want is an analysis that I can hit all of my feasible paths on. So now let's take a look at uh, the work that I've been doing recently, which, yes. Yes. On that slide. So, um, if it's so expensive, how is? But is it still a lot cheaper than doing a full static analysis that would, you know, find all possible things? Well, so I'm, so I'm unaware of a full static analysis that finds all passable paths that doesn't do enough abstraction that you have to either sort of have a lot of false positives right. or don't find certain kind of bugs. Sure. So. And I'm unaware of any dynamic analysis that can hit all the feasible paths because it's so expensive to do that kind of analysis. So what I'm going for is in the middle. Dynamic analysis that scales to many, many machines so I can hit more feasible paths than anyone has in the past. And this overhead is just the cost of doing the symbolic, I mean, expression yes. generation, not the theorem proof. Yeah. At the very end of the talk, I'm going to talk about some very new work that I've been working on, which is to try and take the set and the probabilities of feasible paths and help static analysis drive better with that knowledge. Because I think ultimately the best solution is going to be partially dynamic to find out what customers do and provide a lot of predicate information about feasible paths and then use that in the static domain to try and find paths that are almost impossible to expose without really clever inputs. Yes? Yeah, I guess, I guess one thing that's unclear is the, so if you run a static analysis um, and, and you, you know, and yeah, you don't want to reject every program, right? You, you make some compromises. So it's, it's, you're not going to find every bug, but you're going to find some bugs, right? And you're going to find some bugs. And I guess one question that comes to mind is how much overlap? I mean, how many of the things that you found here would have been found by a reasonable static analysis? Right, or like prefix or whatever. I mean, maybe not just that one, but there's, there are these abstract interpretation-based approaches, right? That, um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, we actually tried to answer that for Eric Larson's thesis, uh, which was back in about 2005. But, um, and he tried to gather a lot of tools to do this sort of overlapped coverage analysis. But the, at the point, in the end, it, you know, these tools tend to be real fragile, and it takes a lot of deep knowledge to get different codes running on them. I think today with, you know, tools like Coverity and such, we could probably do a better job of that today. Although today and now I'm sort of stuck over in the scaling part. Yes? So type state actually does all those things you said can't be done, but it only does it on squeaky clean, clean languages, like none of the ones that we use. 
All right. Um, <laughs> are are you how how pervasive programming language grungy code stuff can you handle? Um, well, today I do the analyses at the instruction level, so I'm really looking at the lowest level of the machine. I'm looking how information flows uh, at that level. We analyze binary. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you can do this analysis at higher and higher levels, and it would be more as you have as you have more type information. You have to check less because the language itself provides you guarantees. Unless the language has bugs in it, in which case you don't have those guarantees. Like C. <laughs> exactly. But, but you, you do have to preserve type information, uh, like the array size and things like that, right? So the language does have to provide enough information that you can do the checking. So, Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, if he's doing binaries, there's no like. I mean, well, that's what I'm curious about. How, I mean, if you're doing it strictly so, on binary, um, binary. binary. So, if we have like debug information okay. and we have instrumentation in the malloc and freeze, we can rematerialize most of the type information. Uh, some of the type information we generate on demand based on how you access the variable. Yes. I'm trying to mentally position this relative to like Dawson Angler and Cache and then this is what here. It seems. So it's like very like kind of I don't know like maybe it's predates it or it's like in a similar direction, but it seems like maybe one distinction is the actual checks that are being put in that you found, like like, like we were discussing. Is there very, we are using all these techniques. They are running uh, on hundred machines as we speak uh, in the Sage fuzzing lab in Windows, etc. Where we add in addition to that, we address the other hard problem, which is test generation. How do you get basically? So that's why not only we generate this constraint, but also we generate new tests. Right. Also, that's another thing here is that you can have false alarms because your symbolic execution of a very large program could basically, you could have your array, array bounce or the constraint solver give you, oh, there could be a buffer overflow here, but actually it may not be. So in addition, you generate the test and you run the program, and only then if you find the bug, then you, you basically tell the developer because otherwise you have yeah. See your false alarms. There's a few cases of we false alarms. We're using these techniques mm -hmm. quite effectively, and we have ex I've been trying also to extend them in combining this uh, test generation. So it's really exactly, I mean, it's very related. So this, this work was done in 2002, Before. just to put it in context. So All right, yeah. I, I think I'm one of the earliest people to do this concolic style execution. Um, I only present it here just to sort of put context around the work that I'm doing today. But I know, I know people have gone way past. Uh, this stuff, and I'm sure people here. Well, there, there are various, as you're going to, I'm sure we should let you proceed. There are various ways to uh, uh, to extend this work. I mean, one is to do test generation yep. in a closed lab, like yep. you do. Exactly. Other is like, what about in the field? That's what we are not currently doing. So, so we have. So let's see. Uh, let's see my proposal for going to the field. Okay. And I, I definitely, want, I know I'm meeting with a number of you out there. I'm looking forward to hear more about what's going on here. So. And that's why I'm here. I want you guys to tell me what's crap about this and what's good. Because I knew that I would get that here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so test sudo. Uh, the approach is you know, it's different than traditional heavyweight analysis techniques where we're going to take a program, we're going to send it into our instrumentation framework, get something that's fully instrumented, send it into the in-house server. We're going to run those analyses. It's going to take quite a while. We'll find some bugs, and we'll fix those bugs. With Testudo, we're going to take a program, we're going to instrument it, we're going to deploy it to all of the customers, and we're going to use a control system to limit the amount of analysis that occurs to a set amount of CPU and memory overhead. So we have to devise an analysis that we can decompose sufficiently, that we can throw away information, but guarantee forward progress over time but also limit the amount of overheads. And I'll show you that for uh, this particular input bounds analysis. Over time, running at virtually full speed, customers will run into bugs. The approach we've taken today is completely uncoordinated, completely random. If people stumble over bugs, they have the option of reporting them back, and then we can push out updates and fix the bugs in all the customer base. And customers, of course, are never happy, but hopefully using this technique, their frustration will start to subsiding. So let's take a look at this. I want to present another uh, piece of code that I'm going to analyze. It's going to read some external input and then just do some computation. But this time I'm going to present it as a data flow. And the reason I'm going to do that is because the way we're going to optimize these analyses 
is by recognizing that the analyses, a vast majority of security vulnerability analyses are tracking data as it flows through your program. And by sampling paths on data flows, we can make forward progress while limiting the amount of work we do. So I read some data to x, I compute the value of y, I compute the value of a, z, y plus. OK, so note, this was my externally input data. These are all the particular operations I check. But note, if I just follow one of these paths from the start to the end and ignore everything else, I actually make forward progress on my analysis. And that's the decomposition mechanism I'm going to use. I'm going to manage my metadata in a way where I throw away information if I have too much load on the system. And I make forward progress for at least one path every once in a while, limiting CPU and memory overheads so that users don't complain about our analysis. And then push that as widely as possible. And then we're going to see how many machines I need to implement that. So, for example, doing a sample data flow analysis, you know, I can, if I analyze X and skip Y and A, I can no longer analyze Z because I have no metadata. I can't analyze uh, Z. And when I get to this Z, I can analyze that metadata if I choose to do so. The asterisk is showing me how far I got. I can run this again. I can, if I get the same input to the same piece of code, I, I hit this data flow again. This time I go down this path. I analyze that A. I analyze the Z. Decide not to analyze Y. Decide not to analyze this Z. And then in a third pass, I do it again. Now, because I'm uncoordinated with this initial approach, I can get a lot of overlap here. I may analyze things a lot of times over and over again. But over time, I should get very good coverage on the paths that are being executed in the program. How do I limit the cost of storage? Well, I only need one metadata value in the system to make forward progress on analysis. One single metadata value. So for example, if I have a a structure which I call the sample cache, which is tracking one particular variable in the system. If I'm tracking nothing here, if I track x, I can pass, I can then overwrite that with the metadata of y. I no longer have this metadata, but I did analyze this node here. Now I have metadata here. I decide not to analyze a. I replace the metadata y with z, and now I have metadata here. And now I can't analyze y because I no longer have metadata for y. I can't analyze Z, I no longer have metadata for X, but with a single location, I've done one path, right? Because I just need one location to hit each one of these paths. Now, if I build a, this sample cache and I randomly replace in it and non-deterministically replace in it, then with a population of users, I can get coverage on all of the data paths. But it's got to be random, select different things every time and non-deterministic, so that if two, two users run the program with the same inputs, they don't select the same paths. If I have more than one entry, I'll get better coverage on these because I can store more paths at the same time. Each entry will allow me to track one path at a time. But if I get too much load on the system, I can always choose to invalidate entries out of my metadata cache to reduce the amount of workload that I have doing analysis. So I have a mechanism to throw stuff away and see less work until I get to one entry and I'll keep that one entry around just to make sure that I make forward progress on my analyses. Yes? So in your example, you know, you've got unique names for everything, right? You know, you've got a Z there and somewhere else. But don't you have to keep track of the full path to know whether you've seen this particular Z before? Well, I know if I, if I have tracked it, let's say I hold Y here. I know that I have, if I have only one metadata value, I know that I've reached on a path from some input that I declared is interesting to this particular value. And as I see y propagate to other values, I can randomly choose whether or not to take those new values or hold on to the value of y. But there might be more than one way to reach that y equals x times 1024. That's true. And, and that's another data flow. And as I see that other data flow, I can get coverage on that as well. I guess what I'm confused about is you say you're keeping a single value there, and it seems to me like you have to keep some notion of what your current path you're looking for is. And that's not that's larger than like a single 32-bit word or whatever. No, I don't have any information about it. I'm just randomly selecting where to go to next. And 
you know, what this becomes is this classic statistical problem called the coupon collector's problem. With no state, but randomly selecting where to go to next in a graph, I always get to all the leaf nodes eventually. It's not very efficient, and the approach I, don't, I have here isn't particularly efficient, and my students are working on better techniques, random algorithms that can do a better job of covering this, but I just want to make the point today, one data value, I can make coverage. Okay. All right. So the, the point here is individual analyses are very cheap. I'm going to scale performance on many runs with many customer machines, and I'm going to increase the size of this cache to cover more flows at the same time. And that cache, by invalidating that cache, is a powerful mechanism to reduce the amount of analysis that I have and to reduce the cost of analysis on any individual machine. Now, there's two implementations of test studio. There's the published one, which is a hardware implementation. It was in Micro 08. And then uh, we just, we're publishing a paper next year on the software version. I'm going to talk a little bit about the software-only version. But first, I just want to present the, the hardware approach for test studio. Um, just walking down the pipeline, showing you what I need to implement this technology. First, I need metadata for register values. Anything that lives in a register, I want to attach metadata to. And uh, we don't sample the data on registers. We just, every register gets its own metadata. And what this information is, is just a pointer to kernel memory that tells us wh where the actual metadata is stored. Because we don't really presuppose what the metadata is in the system. We just track uh, whether any particular data value has metadata and what the pointer is to that value. In the execute stage, we need to have the ability to propagate metadata and to remember how that was propagated. So that if we get a variable, A, added to Y, we need to be able to produce uh, the metadata for the result. Now, sometimes this is very simple. For example, if you're doing taint analysis, if there's one input that's tainted, the output is tainted, and you're done. If you're doing something like symbolic analysis, you've got to go and compute what's the calculus of A plus Y on this metadata and what's my new metadata. And we'll see later in the pipeline, we have a place where we can initiate a kernel call to, uh, to actually compute that data. So we don't really presuppose what that analysis is. So you're doing this at the instruction level, right? So you don't, you don't necessarily have a connection between a register value and a variable, right? So don't you have to look up the, you know, the, the, the debug information every time? Yes. So, the, so, yes. So, for example, when metadata materializes is where we'll get most of that information. So when we take the address of something or when we create some new piece of storage, well, that's where we'll get the majority of that metadata. And then the way, as metadata mixes within instructions, we've got these kernel routines that'll decide how to put stuff together. And I'll... I invite you to look at the USENIC security paper, and you can see there's a big table that shows for every instruction what that calculus is. In the MEM stage, we have a, a sample cache, which is simply a hardware cache that holds metadata pointers. So, and they're associated with a particular address, physical address. So if there's some metadata t attached to a particular memory address, when we do a load or a store, that'll materialize in the registers. And this sample cache is small. It's typically on the order of 128 or 256 entries, and it's randomly replaced. So we re select the entry randomly and non-deterministically. So when we're manipulating this, we, gotta, we have to have some source of true random information in the system so that when we have separate runs on separate machines, we don't see the same updates to that cache so that we get good, good coverage on the data flows. Fortunately, in many hardware today, there's excellent sources of random information. Uh, for example, Intel processors, many of them have the ability to turn thermal noise into random numbers, and those are very useful in this, in this approach. And then finally, at the end of the pipeline, when we retire the instruction, the instruction may have done something that is beyond the scope of what the pipeline can do. So we have this policy map, which basically allows us to say, for example, if you have two pieces of metadata on this opcode, then I want a kernel in interrupt that goes to this address. And it allows you to emulate more complex uh, manipulation of metadata as instructions are run. Software support for Testudo is first we have an OS level controller, which is going to uh, non-deterministically limit new analyses and fan out by watching the overheads in the system. If, 
if the overheads are low, we're going to try and increase flow selection. So when we see new data created, we're going to start following it and we're going to preserve fan out. So that when we see new values coming out of a particular value, we create new metadata for it. When the threshold gets too high, we're going to decrease flow selection. It's less likely that a new flow will get analyzed and we're going to reduce fan out by invalidating entries of the sample cache until we get to the point where we only have one data flow and we preserve that one data flow, even to the point of violating the constraints on CPU and memory overhead. And then once that's gone, we'll wait till we get back below that max load and go back into deciding whether to increase or reduce the flow. In addition, there's special instructions in the architecture that let us mark things that should have metadata initially. And in our implementation, those are in the device drivers. When stuff comes from network, or from keyboard, or from external, other external sources, it gets marked. All right, quickly, how do we do analysis of this? Uh, so we took uh, Virtutex Simix, and we uh, ran a bunch of programs that had some exploits that we could create in them. And we ran them on our simulator. The problem with our simulator, it tends to be slow, and we wanted to get coverage over many, many, many thousands of runs. So what we did is we wrote out, as we executed these experiments, the data flows that we saw, just the data flows themselves, and then brought them into a Monte Carlo simulator, which would implement many different analyses of those particular data flows for the sample cache. So one particular run produces a payload of data flows that we then do thousands and thousands of analyses in this Monte Carlo simulator for the sample cache to see how we get coverage over time. How many runs do I need? For some programs, I don't need a lot of runs to get full coverage on the data flows that I saw on the order of hundreds of more machines. And that with a larger sample cache, 64 instead of 32, uh, even less because I can track more data flows at a time. For other programs, I need more. Like this SQL injection, had, I need as many as 17,000 runs to fully cover the data flows that I saw in the original run of the program. This uh, number right here is a 95% confidence that you've covered all of the data flow paths that you saw in the original run of the program. So if you run your experiment, you've got a 95% probability of seeing this is the case. So what is the intuition of why so many of the cases of SQL injection are in so few data cases? It has to do with the depth of the data flows and the bushiness of the data flows and the size of the sample cache and the amount of analysis that you have to, the payload of analysis. So if you have unlimited analysis and a huge sample cache, you can get very good coverage. But as you start to tighten the amount of stuff you can look at, tighten the amount of overheads that you can tolerate, you need more and more runs. Yes? So with the initial run of um, PDF, how many PDFs did you run? Uh, PDF, that, we just ran one execution of the pro program with one exploit. Okay. So this is how many times to get coverage on that particular run. I see, okay, but there could be other paths that may have been taken. Many, 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 many runs, right? So I, 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 I want to cover many, many, many paths. Yes. Okay. So this is trying to figure out what the explosion factor is from... Exactly. Okay, thank you. So the leverage that I'm going to get in this system is, you know, for example, Apache Web Servers started 570,000 times a second. So if I can put this technology into a widely used program, over time, I'm going to get a huge amount of leverage. And over time, I'm going to work to try and make this even more efficient. So, so yeah, let's see, do you, you have a false positive problem, though, right? Not a very large false well, positive. Okay, but, but I think in the, end, in the end, the question becomes, so you have hundreds of thousands of this data flowing in. How do you prioritize? How do you know? that something is really a good bug to go after versus the other 100 million that you That's have a good, that are not. So, yeah. so one thing we have is we have excellent information about how likely the path you're on is, okay. Okay. which is a very powerful piece of information, um, which gives us some priority information. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, one of the fundamental assumptions here seems to be that control paths don't don't change before the exploit would happen. Whereas, I mean, a lot of vulgs are, we've got IE9, and oh, it still has Gopher support in it. And so, 
it turns out that no one's used Gopher in 15 years, and so I'm going to come up with some bug in the way that Gopher parses something. Right. And so in that case, just by sending Gopher colon slash slash or whatever it is, exactly. right, the, the attacker has already taken you off any path that any uh, non-adversarial users actually yeah. take you on. Yeah, excellent. Excellent point. Um, so this really only gives you good coverage on paths that customers run or on widely exploited uh, bugs. So you see, actually see get coverage on the bugs, the attacks themselves. But I got a foot in that game as well because I get excellent information about what customers do and I can use that information with static analysis to figure out feasible paths that customers don't do. And I think ultimately I can, I can leverage the information that I can gather in the field to really understand what are the possible paths that are not executed, which I think are another great source of bugs, as you point out. And then once you, then you've covered all the paths, right? But to actually follow up on Stuart's earlier question back there, I mean, wouldn't you say that this is perhaps more suitable towards, you know, for, for finding uh, functionality bugs than vulnerabilities, which, as you said, really look at things that nobody else in their like right mind would sort of generally do? Do you think it's vulnerabilities, or is it really functionality bugs that this is most suitable? I guess I don't see the distinction. What's the distinction between vulnerability and functionality bugs? I, guess I, don't, I don't understand the terminology, but I do understand that, that this technology is going to be limited to paths that they could execute. But in some sense, to follow up what Ben just said, it's like a, a super duper symbolic pass profiler. And so they give you exactly how the users in large are using this specific thing. And there are a lot of information that you can leverage out of that. But the match with security, I mean, security may not be the killer app for that machinery because many security vulnerabilities are in exotic code, dead code, things that never, never, never are executed but still being shipped for all kinds of reasons. And they have a very, uh, and they are very signature that in hitting those in the wild, it, it actually uh, can be rare in some cases. And I was going to ask you, do you have evidence that I mean, if you, for instance, do you know of any study looking at a thousand vulnerabilities, for instance, and how many of them were in a frequently traversed path versus almost dead code, yeah, for I instance? I mean, I do not know. I don't know of that either. And I think that's an excellent question. I think Maybe another perspective is what you're catching is what we'd already have encapsulated in a test case, which then existing technology would actually have. Well, that, that's true if your test, if your test coverage is equal to your customer coverage. Yes. So this actually, this is how you build a test suite of expected functionality. Or for, for, for instance, in Microsoft, we have this huge problem of app, app compact, as they call it, app, app application compatibility, etc. cetera. I mean, there are so many different zillions of parameters that defines basically hardware space, uh, the registry state, whatever, you name it. We have, I mean, it's very hard to test, uh, you know, exactly what's going to, and so this can actually give, I mean, so so you guys can answer this question, right? What, how many bugs do you fix on popular parts of the code, and how many bugs do you fix in the crufty code? You ought to have those stats, right? But we have a great tool now. It's called Watson, and so but that's another story. Right? I want to hear about that. Um, we know but, where the bugs in the popular code, code are. Pardon? Right. But, uh, what he's saying is we know where the bugs in the popular code are. So it's very easy to fix. Well, it's not easy to fix those, but there's a long queue of those to get fixed. So all right. of the new bugs, all the new bugs you're seeing are in the crufty code? No. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm seeing some no's, some yeses. <laughs> well, well, part of this goes back to the distinction that we're trying to build in functionality bugs and vulnerabilities. So vulnerability is a bug that allows an adversary to bring security models into the computer, most usually running code as you. Functionality bug could be something as simple as there's a misspelling in this form. It's a bad customer impact because it makes us look like idiots, but you know it's not going to let an adversary through the computer. So, so I think I mean so so it's important to understand a little bit about Watson. So Watson basically is an online crash analysis. So whenever something crashes, it'll send back a thing to Microsoft if you say yes. Okay. So what you see there is you see um, inputs that are going to actually cause the thing to crash. So you're you're seeing things that aren't the ones that caused it to crash that could. And we're seeing the ones that really did. Um, I think what you see from this, from the ones that actually caused it to crash, you see a distribution. And so 
uh, we see that we can see the numbers, just like you'll see the numbers, right? You say this one seems to occur a lot, mm -hmm. this one doesn't occur as often, um, and that allows us to prioritize. But but given that we have real crashing things and we know how frequent they happen, we can't fix all of them. So we're already in a world where here's you know here's we have 10,000 and here's the top 100 that we're going to fix. Um, I guess my question is. If we had this additional information to feed in, in into that yeah, pool, I see. I see your point. Yeah, really, would it help? No, that's an interesting thing to yeah. think about. Yeah. That's that's a very good piece of information. Well, he he's got all the information about uh, you know if he's doing symbolic analysis, that he'll see inputs that you never saw in practice. It would still cause it to fail. Yeah. Yes. I mean, maybe one thing to think about, I and mean, I'm working with Patrice on the test generation, so maybe that's where I'm coming from. If you think of the metadata as like building symbolic formulas, you think about streaming them back to the mothership over time, mm -hmm. you could build up a big symbolic, you know, sketch of what software is exactly. doing. Exactly. And maybe that'll help you find that's some I'm definitely moving towards. Here. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Excellent feedback. Excellent feedback, you guys. That's why I'm here. All right. How much does it cost? Uh, the hardware for this isn't that expensive. So we looked at the cost of uh, 256 to 1K caches on uh, relative to the size of an AMD Phenom or an UltraSpark. And, and, uh, doesn't really hit cycle time that much and uh, fairly low in terms of percentage in terms of area cost. And so I, I, was in, I was at Intel Israel two weeks ago telling them about this technology. And if you know Intel, all of the action is in Israel. That's where they do the processors now. And, uh, and it, uh, you know, I was trying to push this technology, and somebody pulled me aside and said, you know, we're, I think we're building this already for software-based transaction. Now. So there may, be, there may be some synergies between that and this that will allow technologies like this to be rolled out in the near future. So I'm pretty excited about that possibility. Let me talk to you a little bit about future work on this. Uh, just uh, just uh, recently got a paper into CGO11, which is 100% software implementation of this technology. One of the challenges of seeing how well this works is you got to really roll it out and see how well it works. It's hard to do it with just Monte Carlo analysis. So what we built is a LAMP stack that uses this technology. Where we've got Linux OS. We're connected into the LAMP stack through analysis aware drivers that can mark data. And then this runs on top of a Zen hypervisor which uh, has a sample cache implemented with shadow paging. So I, I just use a virtual memory system to track my data. And it's a little more cumbersome because I have to throw away whole pages of data when I want to throw away analysis or pare down a page to a single value if it's my last one. My load controller would decide when to throw away data, when not to initiate new analyses to control my loads, and then when I want to do analyses, I shift over to a QEMU demand-driven analysis. So I'm actually going to do interpretation under the kernel to figure out how to propagate that information through uh, registers. The, the downside of this is it's, we're gonna, it's about you know, quite a bit more expensive, and I'm going to need more runs to do the same amount of coverage. The advantage is eventually I'll be able to deploy this. Another thing that I'm very interested in in engaging on, and I'm currently starting to work on this, is using the technology that we can harvest in the field to find unlikely feasible paths using static analysis. Because I think I can gain a lot of very good information about how the program's used, and a lot of symbolic information to, to uh, help you find feasible paths in the program. And then, Generally, what I need to implement this technology, and generally what you need to implement a variety of vulnerability analysis, is you need efficient fine-grained memory protection. What we really need is to abandon pages of 4K, and I want to be able to mark bytes as code and data, and I want an efficient mechanism. So my student, Joe Greathouse, is the end of his thesis is really working on coming up with efficient fine-grained memory protection techniques. And there's just a variety of things you can implement. You can do garbage collection. You can do software-based transactional memory. You can do security analyses. You can do security uh, attack prevention, varieties of things. So I think there's a huge benefit to try and revisit the virtual memory protection system and try and make it more fine-grained. Yes? Yeah, so there was a recent Intel, Intel workshop where the, the discussion was around whether Intel should support some kind of mechanism like this. And it was, it was sort of more broad as this lifeguards work. Um, 
uh, and but but the, the bottom line is, um, yeah, any any um, you know uh, interaction you can have to, to give Intel reasons to do this uh, would be great. I mean, I think that um, you know the fact that they, they sponsored the workshop, so basically some some belief internally that you know they need to be looking at this direction. But it's been a hard sell. I mean, you know, this the same story was true 15 years ago, right? And you know, and they've heard it. I mean, it's not like it's they don't know that fine grained memory production mechanisms are going to give you a lot of, give some sort of boosted software. Um, but uh, I think the economic uh, argument around how it helps customers is still not there. Um, you know, so sure, that's, I mean, yeah, I mean, it is true that all the benefits were there 15 years ago. To be, this is unfair and exaggerated, we'll make the point. They no longer have anything better to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, but given that, they're, they're still asking the question, who's going to buy this? I mean, fundamentally, no, I understand. And, and in fact, the, the discussion at this workshop was more around, um, you know, uh, could we could we create a skew of a processor that, that we sold for more money and only targeted developers? Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, because developers are the ones that really want this, and your, your average customer doesn't see the value. So, how much more would a would a developer pay, or would Microsoft pay? For the I think you don't. You don't market. Oh, here, here. He is not a Microsoft employee. I know who he is. <laughs> the I know who he is. Okay. I know who he is. No, because that's <laughs> just kidding. He's <laughs> recorded here. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Says about Intel. Okay. <laughs> I have a blue badge. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so, when I presented this at Microsoft, they they, they felt uncomfortable. Like, we, I don't think we'd put a security something to help find security bugs in our processor because that would just imply that we have a lot of security bugs on the platforms that we use our processors in, which seems like a very uh, seems like an odd thing to say. But from a marketing standpoint, you know that that might you know it might. People might fear a system that has to fix bugs, right? So, you know, my my idea is you should you should just make it. You should what you should do is you should say that you know this has branded with you know extra security, extra safety technologies. And I think that's the fundamental issue is that um, if you could show a benefit to an individual customer, that's really good, and they put, they'll put it in, and they can they can market it with that. But the, but the, what you're talking about are developer tools. It makes the the software better. But uh, but it's only indirect. It's but the, not like the, if here, I, if I the pay way. more for my processor, I don't get the benefit of this. Here's Everyone the, gets here's it. Here's the way you get the benefit of the customer. We've got great information on the likelihood of the path that the bug is found, on, the potential bug. And what you do is if, if the likelihood drops below a certain level, you just you say, hey, here's a $50 off coupon if you hit send for your next Microsoft product. And then it becomes then it becomes a valuable technology. So you're saying that maybe these people who explore these bad lab hackers will not want the fifty dollars you offer, right? I mean again there is that the disconnect with, between benign users and attackers and what you're looking for. The problem with the attacker is they're just one, right? The attacker isn't the isn't the hive, right? They're just one person in the hive. So their probability of finding these are very, very low. Yeah. So what much larger magnitude are we going to be talking about for the yeah. software implementation today? And what do you think you can get down to like if you really hacked on Zen? And a really fast queuing. So, so I, I'm not going to go into details on this yet. Sure. But it's about three times as many runs to reach the same level of coverage. But, but for me, as someone running on top of this, do I see a two x slowdown, a five x slowdown? All of our experiments are limited to five percent memory and five percent. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's it's just a shaving. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so over the, uh, over the last, I don't know, seven, five, seven years, we've seen basically a decline in these low level memory uh, types of vulnerabilities and an increase in vulnerabilities like, uh, well, say, SQL injection process script and what have you, as well as browser things now and so on and so forth. And then the story kind of keeps uh, evolving. So, what are your thoughts on applying techniques that are perhaps similar to this, maybe not at the level of hardware, some other levels, to those more semantic, shall we say, vulnerabilities? Sure. So, anywhere, so I think the, this work is valuable anywhere where you have data flow. You have invariants that you can either infer or exist. In my case, they exist, but maybe you can infer those invariants. I know there's a lot of work in that domain. And, uh, and overheads are a concern. Then I think these kind of sampling techniques can work at any level, and it's a dynamic analysis. It's yes. actually I was doing this in the I was doing this in the web space uh, for the distributed case where we were trying to infer 
the state of a web of a web application in the state space, given users traversing over it. And it is the same story. And actually, in, in particular, the users have an exact distribution. They will go to the Google homepage. They will go to the Gmail homepage. They're not going to explore the preferences panel very deeply. It is the same story. So, so can you say a little bit about the relationship between Todd Maurer's work on lifeguards and, and this kind of stuff? His, his is targeted not for security specifically, but just for instrumentation and for, you know, sort of, sort of in a general way. Um, so uh, I guess the question is, could you implement much of what you're talking about with the same mechanism Could, that he's talking about? I'm not 100% not familiar with lifeguards. Okay. What is, give me a, just so, a so sense the high of level, So the high-level takeaway, it's, it, it's, a, it's a hardware channel that allows information about things that are happening, instructions, you know, things like what addresses are being accessed, et cetera, to be sent over to a separate um, uh, oh. core on the, on the multi-core and handled there, essentially. So it's, you know, um, it's a high-bandwidth way to collect data in the running uh, processor. So that, that would be a good mechanism to implement this kind of analysis, okay. right? So uh, in, a, in, in a sense, all those policy map calls could go over to uh, another, uh, yeah, could, could go over to another uh, processor. I, I think that would be. OK, and then lastly, just really interested in adapting this and other analysis techniques. The core of the Testudo work is not really security. We've applied it to security, but it's really data flow analysis. And currently, Joe, my student, is, is, uh, is applying this to finding race bugs in parallel programs, which is another very good data flow analysis that's super heavyweight to implement. Yes. So let's bring this full circle. So he started by you know, talking about in-house testing and then distributing this uh, back you know, essentially out in the field. And then you know, when you talk about data centers, it's essentially bringing much of that back mm -hmm. in-house, if you will. So what are your thoughts on you know, putting this into a data center? What are the trade-offs you see from, from that? I mean, it's even more ideal, okay. right? Because you have lots of systems running many times your software. And in addition, you, it's in your own domain so that you have more ability to provide information that's necessary to improve the analysis, reduce the cost of the analysis. Like, for example, I could provide a lot of type information, a lot of invariants that I've collected over time that I wouldn't push out to a customer because that information might be privileged or important. I don't want to release that intellectual property. Now, I can, now since it's local, I can do even better. So I see this in the data center as being an even more powerful technology. All right, so to conclude, if you want to beat the hackers, find the bugs they love and fix them before they do. Get rid of those zero-day exploits. We talked about three technologies. Metadata restores programmers' intent, and we need a mechanism to manage this efficiently. Input balance checking is an example of a security vulnerability analysis that finds those bugs before you release software. The advantage of this particular technology is it finds exploits without an active attack. The problem with these technologies is they're too expensive. They really slow down programs. So Testudo is a technology that can roll these, uh, roll these analyses out into the field and use the customer base as a massively parallel system to find these bugs in an uncoordinated, random way. So thank you very much. By the way, I want to tell you what a Testudo is. This is a Testudo. It's a Roman legion formation where they take each of their shields and lock them together to form one single protection for the entire mass. So that's why we called it Testudo. What about their legs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. This, this is a, yeah, these are your device drivers and your, uh, <laughs> and your hypervisor, which is unprotected. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so I had just a uh, final question. Um, so you, uh, you're doing a lot of you know, um, buffer overflows and sort of array out of bounds uh, errors. But, but uh, use after free is actually a major source of attack. In fact, it's one of the things with Ambell's law. I mean, it, even if you completely remove all the buffer overflows, you still have a lot of vulnerabilities in the code. Um, I mean, that would fit so great into this framework. Is, can, you, can you do anything about yeah. that? That's a data flow analysis, right? The, um, the metadata I need is whether storage is live or not, like some capability associated with the variable. Right. So yeah. Okay. Let, let's say I did it like, like we did it when I worked on safety years ago. We generated capabilities for all heap storage. We attached it to pointers, and we propagated those capabilities. And those capabilities were destroyed when the data was free. 
That's a data flow analysis that I could sample in the system to try and find where when I dereference is that particular capability, that, is that mark still uh, existing. That would fit into this style of analysis. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.